So, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along to our talk today. My name is Mary Dawson. Um, I work for Baron Brook. We are international grass seed breeders and producers. And as you might expect, we think grass is the most important crop, uh, not just in the UK, but in the world. And today we are just going to talk to you a little bit about grassland back to basics. Um, I've got some uh, highly qualified colleagues here to talk to you. Um, starting off with just getting the grass seed established, getting grass wards established, then a bit more into the soils. And we'll finish off with um, one of our farmers who will tell you about his story um, and his integration of grass into his uh, farming business and how that works. So um, like it just to be nice and relaxed, you know, we're getting to the second half of the second day. We're just gonna sit and have a nice relaxed chat. Um, love of your know, questions later on after we've heard from our four speakers. And uh, without further ado, I'll pass over to Roger and let him introduce himself. Thanks, Mari. Um, I'm Roger Bacon. I'm the key account manager for Barenbrook UK. Um, it's good to see you all here. And, and I'm just going to cover really the basics on establishing a new lay and reseeding a sort of lay and, and a herbal lay. So uh, pretty much, um, I'll just mention the benefits. Really. There's multiple benefits to putting grass and uh, clovers into uh, in, into the ground uh, starting with sort of soil health um, from sort of fertility point of view uh, following crops improving soil structure and also carbon sequestration some grasses are, um, uh, capture quite a lot of carbon there's big differences between a perennial ryegrass and uh, and something like a tall fescue then you've got the benefits of, of drought tolerance as well um, then there's animal health benefits if you've got uh, um, herbs in the in the mix from mineral contents and anthelmintic properties um, and then you've also got obviously with, with using legumes and clovers you can reduce the reliance on on bag nitrogen um, the, the the important thing really is to select the species that's suitable for your, for your farm and soil type so if, for example if you've got heavy clay you won't be able to grow lucerne or, or sandfoin uh, so make sure that the species that you're growing and the species that are in the mix are going to be suitable for your, your soil type and also your requirements for what you're actually looking for in the end result. Um, establishment is key, and, and attention to detail uh, is one thing that is really worth focusing on. Uh, and one thing that I always say is it, uh, and we sort of try and promote, is that it all starts with the soil. So you really need to get your uh, pH uh, uh, up to sort of 6.5, and your P and K indices need to, need to be 2 uh, as well. And any soil structure uh, problems really need, need addressing to get the best out of your, your lays. Um, ideally, um, could need to be sown between May and August, particularly if you've got clovers and, and herbs in the, in the mix, uh, and really looking for a, a, you know, into a warm seabed and ideally some moisture. So if any, any of you have looked around our, our plots uh, these last couple of days, and they were all planted at the end of August last, last year, and they've had very little rain since. So uh, you know, we, we're having the same sort of issues and challenges that you guys have had over the last 12 months. Uh, create a good seed bed. That's, that's also pretty crucial. I'm not going to say a fine, firm seed bed because it can be too fine, particularly if you get rain afterwards and then, and then you get capping. But, uh, but a good seed bed, which is firm, is, is sort of really crucial. Uh, a cloddy wheat seed bed is no good for grass seed uh, or, or clovers. And, uh, and roll afterwards. Seed bed consolidation is, is another sort of key factor that will influence the success of your uh, reseed. Um, so if, if you've got a loose fluffy soil then um, the, the grass is likely to germinate but uh, it's unlikely to sort of establish well because it will run out of moisture. So seed bed consolidation, seed to soil contact is, is crucial. And, uh, and sowing depth, um, again um, ideally you know, grass is a small seed, clover seeds are small, we're looking for a seed depth of, of no deeper than, than 10 mil uh, to get the optimum uh, establishment. And if you're using a direct drill, um, there's some, some big kit out there that's on demo today. Uh, just be careful not to drill too deep. There's a temptation to, to put it in and, and go searching for moisture, but that will uh, result in failure, I'm afraid. Um, and reduce competition. So if, if you're looking at either going into cover crops or, or older lays, then uh, uh, either graze the old lay hard or terminate your cover crops before, uh, before put, uh, drilling the, the new grass seed just to reduce that competition for the new plants. Or you could always spray out with glyphosate as well. Um, yeah, so the other thing with, uh, with using some of these new direct drills, if, if they're with wide spacings, if you've got a multi-species lay, you can get a lot of competition between the rows. 
So if you've got something like some aggressive hybrid or perennial ryegrasses, and then you've got red clover in there, and it's all crammed into one row on a, and a wide spacing, then the sort of clovers and herbs will will suffer. They will get outcompeted by the grasses. So one one sort of tip on that is to perhaps um, plant the grasses first, and then cross it the opposite way with the uh, with the clovers and the herbs. So it's given the those species plenty of room to uh, to get established. Um, yeah, and, and just remember as well that weed control in, and certainly in multi-species herbal lays is, is pretty non-existent. So if you are expecting uh, weeds to come, then uh, either you know plan well ahead, choose your fields, uh, and, and perhaps it might be worth establishing the grasses first, spraying out any weeds, and then uh, and then sowing the, the the sort of clovers and herbs into it later on. So uh, then we come on to once you've got your your sort of grass and herbal lays established is looking after it in that first first year. So anything you do in that first 12 months will have a, a real significant effect on the on the persistency of those of those swords. So the key things there really are um, give it a nice light grazing um, to start with, just to nip the tips off. So you're encouraging tillering and stimulating growth. And also don't overgraze or, or overcut in that first sort of 12 months or at any point really, because it, it reducing the sort of stubble, you're actually reducing the, the photosynthetic area and removing energy from the plant and therefore its ability to then recover after a grazing or, um, uh, or cut. So plant recovery there is, is the key thing. So um, yeah, leave plenty of, uh, plenty of stubble. Um, that's it from me, so I'll pass you on. Thank you very much, Roger. That's a really good um, introduction. You touched on soils there. Um, and next we have Ian Robertson from Hutchinson's. You're head of soils, is that right? Uh, you're going to give us a bit more detail on that because um, obviously it doesn't matter what crop you're sowing, whether it's grass or whether it's cereals, it has to go into the right soil conditions. So over to you. Yep, great. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a really good point that you can spend an awful lot of money on some really good quality seed and then get all your soil conditions wrong stick the seed in the ground, and then go back and go, damn, that seed didn't work. It's got nothing to do with the seed at that point. It's how the soil was, uh, the condition the soil was in when we put it into it. So there's an awful lot that we need to understand about soil before we start spending money on whether it's cultivation equipment or fancy seeds putting into the ground. And to do that, I think we need to go all the way back to basics of what is soil. And soil fundamentally is a medium for microbial activity. And if you look at what we're then doing, we're buying some, some grass seed. That grass seed is connecting the sun to the microbial activity. And if we get the, the, the soil structure right, the seed goes in, it germinates, picks up the sunlight, pushes sugars, carbohydrates into the soil. That feeds microbial activity. That microactivity feeds the grass. And then we've got a start of a, start of a system. And the brilliant thing about grass is it tends to be in the ground for 365 days a year. So we're all here talking about one of the principles of regenerative farming practices, and that is keeping your soil covered with a living living root, or a living mulch with a root in it. And that's where grass fits in really, really well. However, grass isn't always the solution. And it goes back to what I said at the beginning, that you don't just stick grass in and walk away from it. As Roger said, you've got to manage it, look after it. We also need to make sure that we understand why the soil is performing like it does to make sure that we're putting the right grass species in or whether that's a herbal lay or just straight grass. And to do that, we need to look into the soil and find out what is the physics, the chemistry, and the biology. Again, it's been talked about, if you've been to many of the lectures in the last two days, there's an awful lot of talk about physics, chemistry, and biology. The easiest thing we can do before you do anything in the ground is take a chemical soil test. If you measure, measure your soil chemistry, that will tell you how your soil is performing, why it's performing, because the, the chemical aspects, things like magnesium and calcium, affect the physics of the soil, and the physics of the soil, in turn, will affect the biology of the soil. So when you are doing soil tests, I'd implore you to go and dig deeper. Don't just do a, a basic PHPK soil test. Sorry, I'll go a bit deeper. Look at what the actual makeup of the soil is. Do things like the aqua regia extract, which measures the total extractions of your soil. The, the, the simple analogy we use quite often is when you do a, a simple soil test, industry soil test, you measure the uh, plant food that's available on the kitchen table, the fridge. If you do the aqua regia extract or the total extract, you're measuring the deep freeze, the pantry, the larder. 
And that's the key part, that what we're doing with grass and management practices is going into your deep freeze and your larder, pulling out nutrition, converting it into something the plant can eat on your kitchen table. If you don't do that, you don't understand the total amount of food you've got, you can spend a lot of money going to the shops to keep filling your fridge up, which is brilliant. You carry on doing that, I don't mind. But actually, most of you will have a significant large free deep freeze. Let's utilize it. Grass is a really, really good way of utilizing it. Because I said earlier, we, we put the grass in, it connects the sunlight to your microbes. The microbes are what dissolve soil, solubilize soil to feed your grass. Now, you can feed it out of a bag. I've got no problem with that. But actually, fundamentally, only about 2% of the dry matter in your grass is nitrogen. You've got more pot potash, calcium, carbon. 45% of your dry matter in grass is carbon. And that carbon is coming from, again, the grass taking sunlight in, pushing sugars in, feeding microbial activity. That microbial activity converts organic matter into carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is released, and grass has got stomatas on the underside of its leaves. It drinks the carbon dioxide and grows more. Oh, and then it pushes a bit more sugar in. So you've got a really good closed system that is building soil fertility. Um, so that's one of the key parts of why, why grass is really, really good. If you have massive imbalances in your soil, I would always address them before I rely on something like a grass or even a cover crop to, to address it. Because you've got to always get your chemistry and physics right before you try and do a biological thing. Now, again, cover crops, grasses will, will deliver for you, but they will deliver an awful lot more for you if your soil structure is right. And it sounds very boring, but going back to chemistry and physics first, understand it, digging holes. When Ed and I spend a lot of time digging holes, he's one of the most exciting people you'll meet today. Um, he's not. Uh, but if you don't do that, you then rely on a drill, or you drilled it, it didn't work. It wasn't the drill's fault. The grass seed didn't germinate. It wasn't the grass seed's fault. It was the soil structure fault. Have we earned the right to direct drill our grass seed? Have we checked if we've earned the right to do it? If you don't know what you're looking for, Ed will do it for you. Won't you? No. Um, go out, dig holes. Really simple. If you can't dig holes, get someone to help you dig holes. If you don't want to do that, send some soil off for detailed soil analysis. Listen to the advice they give you. That advice that they're given, if good advice, will change the soil for you. Changing the soil for you will make any crop you grow in there more productive. Not necessarily just the amount of biomass you grow, but about the nutrient density, the balances, which then will feed into your animals, and you'll get a much better, stronger, balanced animal thereafter. And it's Sounds very complicated. It's, it's really simple, and that's hopefully what Ed and Dan are going to talk about, actually putting that into practice on the farm, changing some of the cultivation methods, some of the bulk inputs that then had a massive effect on soil structure and ultimately in, in crop growth. So at that point, I'm going to hand over to Ed, I think. Thank you, Ian. Is this working? No, it doesn't, doesn't sound like it's working. Is it? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. So, yeah, the, the danger of going third after these two guys was, of course, that they would talk about most of what I was going to talk about. So thanks for that. So I'm going to make this up as I go along and try and f sort of fill in some of the gaps. Um, so really just talk. So my my day job as such is helping people like Dan implement regenerative agriculture on farms. So really everything I do, we do always comes back to those those key principles that, that Ian's already alluded to. Um, and grass is a fantastic way of ticking a lot of those boxes. So if we look at the, the principles of maintaining living roots all the time, obviously with perennial species is a fantastic way of doing that. Um, introducing diversity uh, and obviously integrating livestock um, it comes, comes sort of hand in hand largely with, with growing grass as well. And a business like Dan's, you know, is it's a fully integrated livestock and arable business. Um, Grass itself is a really good way of, of breaking up the rotation. You know, we, we're sort of struggling a bit at times with, with break crops in arable rotations. Um, and to be able to bring in grass, provided obviously you have a use for it, um, is a really good way of breaking up that, that pest and disease cycle that we, we can have in, in arable rotations. Looking at uh, input reduction and particularly nitrogen, uh, a grass lay, particularly a diverse one, including legumes, is a fantastic way of building up fertility and then obviously reducing nitrogen in your, in your subsequent arable crops. 
I've put improving soil structure question mark because, um, as I alluded to yesterday, I've gone and looked at uh, fields coming out of a grass lay actually in better, uh, in worse state than they went in because of the way that that grass lay has been managed. So what you choose to, to sow in terms of that lay and how you then manage it um, has a huge influence on whether that grass lay is a benefit or not. So that takes um, some quite careful thinking about. Um, for a lot of people, particularly mixed farms or solely livestock farms, it, it, is, it is your sole crop. It's your, it's your key way of, of getting forage. Um, we as humans thrive on a mixed diet and a healthy diet, so our livestock are no different. So for me, if you're going to go down the grass route and make the best of it, it always needs to have a level of diversity in it. Um, we don't want to eat the same thing three times a day, every day of the week for the rest of our lives, neither do our stock. So always make sure you've got diversity in that mix where you can, even if it's just adding a legume or having a few different grass species, um, try and get diversity where you can. Another potential benefit, uh, certainly with the more diverse lays, is improving biodiversity and habitat on the farm. So if you are a predominantly arable business, uh, you're looking at largely, not everybody, but largely monoculture fields, broken up potentially by hedges, odd bits of woodland, watercourse, bringing in grass into the rotation um, is another habitat. So you're going to have, you're going to be able to host different insect species, bird species. But again, that comes down to how you manage it and what you sow. Uh, just to touch on, yeah, weed control, it's, it's a big thing. The, the amount of times that we've kind of gone for these fancy mixes and then a year later it's full of docks and thistles and we've got absolutely no, no way of controlling them. Um, so just think about field select, fields as well as uh, when you come to choosing your, your lays. And something I've qu done quite often is actually drilled, drilled the grass in the first year, let that come, let the weeds come with it, then take the weeds out and stick your, your legumes and herbs in afterwards, which, which works really well. Um, so it's just about knowing field history and what to expect in terms of weed control. Also, the grass itself is a weed. So if this is an arable rotation, think about what you're doing with that lay as it comes out and back into the arable rotation and implications that that might have uh, in the following crop. And finally, I think to just reiterate what Ian said is attention to detail and Roger to said as well, you know, treat it like any other crop. You know, you would, you would nurture a wheat crop from the minute it arrives on farm in a bag to the minute you harvest it. So grass should be no different. Um, and you can, you can waste a lot of time and money by not giving it that attention to detail. Uh, I guess something as well that I just wanted to pick up on, if you are an arable farmer thinking of potentially bringing grass in, one of the ways that might just help with that financially is mid-tier uh, and now SFI, or if you're an existing grassland farmer uh, with, with grass in the rotation or all grass, we've got the soil standards coming up now, which will pay you 58 quid a hectare for just doing good farming. So why not fill out the forms and take it because it's, it's there to be had. But from an arable perspective, there's AB15 legume, uh, grass legume fallows, which are quite useful from a grass weed control point of view. You've got GS4 herbal lays. There's, there's options within there, so make the most of them. And that's it from me. Lovely. Thank you very much, uh, both to Ian and Ed. Uh, our final panellist today is Dan Belcher, um, and Dan's going to tell us a bit about your, your system, your farm, um, and how you've integrated grass and the, the arable rotation. Uh, I, yeah, we're, so we're um, in Leicestershire on um, predominantly heavy clay, high mag clays as well, so it presents a fair lot of challenges going forward. We've always been a, a mixed farm, um, had some quite rapid growth over the last two to three years. And with that growth, we've inherited some very tired arable ground that needs life giving back to it. And that's what's made us look more in depth at how we can introduce more grass species and more varied grass lays into what we're doing. We Historically, we've been on very basic sort of rye grass with a clover mixing with it sort of thing. And then but trying to break the weed burdens and improve soil health and water infiltration and various other things has led us more down the route of herbal lays and where we are now. Um, we're only really in the second year of introducing herbal lays. Um, and so far, we've had mixed results. We've had some fantastic results where we got it right. And then we've had some 
<laughs> not such good results where we didn't get it right and and we'll well hopefully we'll get it all right one day but we'll we'll, we'll figure that out but in terms of um the herbal lays with views yeah <laughs> in terms of the herbal lays with views we've put in two different kinds one for mowing and then one for just solely grazing in the in the mowing lays we took the chicory out and as Roger mentioned earlier, we're sort of looking at soil types. We're not putting any lucerne in and various things like that because it'd just be a waste of time and potentially upping the clover in, in reality. Um, the On the mowing lays, we chopped them about two weeks ago when we'd got uh, Westerwolds in that had 90 kilos of nitrogen a hectare. We got a, like a cutting and grazing mix that would be in its third year. They'd also had 90 kilos and then a herbal lay that had nothing. And the herbal lay was out yielded the Westerwolds and about matched the uh, the, the mixed long-term lay. So from no inputs, we were very pleased with that, really. Um, we're also trying to introduce a, a paddock grazing system. We're sort of, that's very early days for us. We, we haven't, we're sort of in our second year of putting cattle around it. Um, last year, we didn't stock it hard enough. I think this year we've stocked it too hard. We don't seem to be getting those residual covers left behind us and we're looking quite short of grass at the moment, so we might have to come up with a, another plan on that for the for the back end of the summer um we did paddock graze sheep last year on four day moves we had 200 200 ewes on 30 acres and we would go around that every every sort of 24 days and that worked well until we got to this time of year where we got seed head problems um so it's yeah it's still very much work in progress um what we have found so far though is that we're getting a lot more Bio biological activity in the ground. You dig a hole now. Well, when Ed first came, you couldn't get a shovel in the ground, could you? It was he broke his first one. He's on his Leicestershire shovel now. So, um, and and so from that perspective, now you you still having to give it a bit of welly to get it in, but it's certainly given us uh, given us inspiration to carry on with it. Um, but establishment methods, we've tried several ways of establishment, and as Roger and Ian both said earlier, not rushing is the biggest thing we've learned. We sort of ploughed some ground last year and worked it and we're worried about the date for getting the seed establishments because a lot of these small seeds want six weeks before we see them probably didn't get the seed red would have been better to wait for the weather window um so they came patchy um the best lays came from a simple uh simple bit of light tillage on the top and then established with a grass arrow behind but one thing we've seen everywhere this year is a lot of jack thistles appearing so we're just going to try we've just sprayed two fields off now that we're going to um Go in with a, a fodder rape quickly now, establish that, let them have four weeks, take a light graze. Hopefully we'll get the weed bank to establish, spray that back out and then go back in with a, a herbal lay and hopefully see that it comes a lot cleaner afterwards. Um, I don't know if there's anything Ed or Ian want to add to that. Um, and then following grass lays as well, we've since found that our best mode of establishment after it is, is a direct drill and the best crop we seem to be following grass lays with currently is spring beans just a real simple in with a tie and drill and it, it is by far our best gross margin on a spring crop out following it as well yeah yeah so just coming back to establishment um going back to those five key principles obviously the first one is minimize tillage and the most important word there is minimize not eliminate completely so you will always be better off if you need to to do a little bit of tillage to get a successful lay established than try and stick to the uh, stick to your guns, go and direct drill it and just just have a failure because neither soil health or productivity from that field will will, will do any good if you've if you've been too strict to those principles and tried to not move soil and, and had a poor result. So if you've got to move a bit of soil, do so. And also, if you look at the soil that Dan's on, he's got very high he's meant to clay, clay content and it's got quite high magnesium in it. Magnesium is a soil that wants it, it bricks the soil tight together. It holds on a, on a very, very small level. The cation exchange capacity pulls your, your soil tight. So if you try and direct drill in a mag, it's much harder to do it. So we're addressing that, we're addressing the chemistry of that by putting calcium sulfate on with a gypsum putting that on, that then changes the flocculation on the surface of your soil that allows it much easier to be direct drilled. So just going out and direct drilling a high mag soil is kind of a recipe for disaster because you're only looking at it in a physical view. We're not really looking at the chemistry in a biological view. And that's why when we did, or Ed and I started, we started dig digging holes, breaking spades, 
And then we started doing the chemical test to understand why we broke the spade. And now we're trying to address all those things with gypsum, less cultivations, grass seed coming into it, all those, joining, joining the picture together, really. Well, as you said, we've got, we've got a whole, we've got all the elements we need in the ground, but they're all locked up currently. I mean, you look at our nutritional value in the soil, it's massive. We shouldn't ever need to put anything on again, but we've just got to get that cycling and get it active. And we, the soil sample brought out, didn't it? We got really low active carbon. So a big thing for us is to get that carbon in the ground, like I say, through these diverse lays and try and have something in the ground all the time that is, is, is bringing that carbon in. Yeah, they, they, yeah people that don't know about the active carbon, there's, there's lots of ways of measuring organic matter, do mass, loss by ignition, etc. They measure the, the total amount of organic matter in your soil. There's a, a soil test called potassium permanganate, or active carbon, that measures the fraction of that organic matter that is cycling. So it's quite a good proxy to microbial activity. So you can go out there and you get a soil test that we're doing with good high organic matters, and yeah. brilliant, well done, Dan, tick that box. But actually, that organic matter is stuck it's not got the microbial process to break it down to carbon dioxide, nitrogen, phosphorus, zinc, manganese, all the bits you want to feed the next crop. So what we're trying to do, again, is address that as a whole rotation so we get the organic matters in there to cycle. And if it cycles, it feeds the next crop. And if you're doing that, then you're a lot less reliant on bringing more nutrition in because we're going down to the deep freeze. That Dan's got a blooming big deep freeze. We just need to make sure that we allow ourselves to access it. Done it again, Ian, sending people to sleep, look. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> um, I think you've, um, you've all touched on some really important points there, but um, well, the overarching thing is change and being flexible and being able to adapt to what's going on. So, Dan, a question for you. As you've started down this journey, do you think your mindset has changed in the, in the whole process? Yeah, I think um, when we took this land on two years ago. I think we knew that it couldn't carry on in the order it had been farmed and it was pretty evident from just looking at it and, and from the initial soil samples and, and walk rounds we did that it was it was pretty well lifeless sort of thing. I mean, we've got worm counts at almost zero. There's a lot of juvenile worms there now this, this spring when we've dug. Um, and I think the grassland plays a very important role. We're, we're fortunate enough that we have a... We've, we've come at it from the other angle, I suppose. We've come at it from livestock farmers into arable rather than vice versa um so it's not a shock to us to have to sort of understand that side of it and it's actually made arable farming more interesting i think because you're looking at it more as a livestock you're actually wanting to understand the the health of what you're doing rather than if an animal's sick you try and go back and understand why it's sick and treat that illness whether it be through minerals or whereas on an arable farm if something hasn't been working it seems to me that it's just been put some more of a fertilizer on or put some more spray on and that'll solve the problem and we're at a place where that's not working and yeah, I think these these diverse herbal lays you can you can certainly see the benefit in the in the stock. And I mean, we're hoping to get to a point in the future. We're probably five years away from it yet, but where we can start to measure nutritional density. And if, if that's something we can do, then I, I would imagine the more diverse lay we can have, the the more nutritionally dense your produce is going to be. And I feel that grain will probably be marketed like that in the future as well. And we've talked a bit about you know, introducing um, grass into arable, but for, um, I think, Ed, it was you touched on somebody that just you know, maybe has a very simple lay to start with um, and perhaps are maybe not going to go down the stewardship line, but what's, what's their first step for the livestock farmer, grass and clover, where do they go next with their swords to try and improve that diversity? And perhaps, Roger, you might come into this as well. Yeah, I, th I think... Start small. If 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 you're not used to, to diversity in your lays, is is yeah. Start small. So there's some there's some kind of quite good go tos. You know, plantain chicory tend to work well on most most farms. You've got to be careful a little bit with chicory in terms of seed rates and just managing it. But yeah, just just try one or two things each season, and 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 it comes down to what works on your farm. <clears throat> As you get into some of the more kind of niche herbs within some of these herbal lays, they they like quite a specific type of soil, quite a specific nutritional profile in that soil. Drainage is important. So not everything will work on every farm. So I think it's about just introducing it almost one at a time and see see what works. Um, but yeah, just just start, start small. And, and also within the, within the grass itself, try and, try and use two or three different grass types um, within that. It's much like in an arable rotation, we look at blended varieties within within monocrops grass is grass is no different 
Yeah, no, if I could just still add to that as well. Um, I completely agree what Ed was saying, and I think one of the biggest things is to keep it simple as well. There's a lot of complicated herbal lays out there, and, um, and if you look at the GS4 mix, it's a multitude of species in there. Um, if you don't need to go down the GS4 route, then you can cut that, you know, cut those species back considerably. Um, so things like chicory plantain are quite simple to to establish they're quite vigorous chicory yeah just be careful on on the seed rate keep it back a bit if you're not used to managing it um, and the other thing is is clovers as well or legumes you know clovers are particularly white clover is reasonably easy to uh, to establish into a into a grass crop and, uh, and you know it has the ability to fix about 150 kilos of nitrogen from the atmosphere so you say i'm making some big savings in terms of uh, bought in nutrition um, and just to set, you know, have a look at your grass crops here. And if you've got a worn out lay, then, you know, throwing a few herbs in it um, isn't necessarily going to rescue it. You, it's going to be a case of starting from scratch. So just be pragmatic about your approach as well. Have we got any questions from the audience at all? Yeah, there's a Rovin Michael just come. So if I start with a uh, established monoculture ryegrass sward and I want to convert that to a mixed lays. I hear everybody talking about spraying. Can it be done without spraying? What's the least worst option? Oh, thanks. Um, okay, so... Yeah, having done that a few times, it's, it is possible without without spraying. Um, if you don't want any of that ryegrass to come back, you've obviously got to use whatever means you can to, to get rid of it non-chemically. So that's going to be uh, heavy grazing or some cultivation of some, some degree. If you're happy with a bit of ryegrass coming back in whatever you're then going to sow into it, um, then that's fine. But still, you'll because ryegrass is incredibly vigorous as you know it's a case of getting it back down to a level that buys you time to get your other stuff established before the ryegrass then then comes back in anger but um yeah glyphosate isn't doesn't have to you know be a necessary part of of, of stitching in a new lay or re-establishing a lay it's there's there's other ways around it um again a little bit of cultivation shouldn't be, you shouldn't be afraid to do it if you need to yeah or use a stock, but there's obviously, you know, there's there's dangers with running large numbers of stock and hammering it, and that you, what are you doing to soil structure um, as a result? But e either can work and have worked. Yeah, if you if you're looking at um, sort of um, putting species into an established lay, then worst case scenario, if you've got an old thatchy lay that is predominantly perennial ryegrass, then you'd need to remove some of that thatch as well. With some of the uh, uh, more diverse species, you take tall fescue for example they're they're not very competitive so that wouldn't be a good one to try and sort of stitch in but other species like coxfoot timothy would you know would be okay so um and yeah you, you know you're gonna have to graze it hard it's the only time i would um advocate taking it right down and uh, you know just to reduce that competition and probably harrow it as well to pull some of that thatch out any more questions Um, we're organic, so this is a bit of a specific question. Hi, Ian. Um, if if we, we have two year lay clover, uh, uh, clover lays and we have to plough because we can't spray, but if you're trying to follow that with a crop, how much you, we spend a lot of time building up N and all these other th all these other good things? How do you protect? What? How do you not lose what you've just gained? before the crop's big enough to start picking up and getting the roots down deep and picking up. Uh, how do you, we're good at building things, but often we're good at ruining it all as well. Um, if you've got a, a, a clover lay there, you've, you've grazed it or it's, it, it's a fertility builder, the, the easiest thing to do is mow that as close to cultivating as possible. So you're putting green to brown. And at that point, you've got a very good carbon to nitrogen ratio, so it will cycle quite quickly for you. You're putting it in the ground, and then you're following it pretty much straight behind with your crop. You're going to drill into it. That crop you're drilling into it will establish and go down, and it will pick up that cycling, cycling nutrition. You were never going to get away from the fact that if you do any cultivation at that point, you will oxidize some of the goodness. That, that's nature. That's what's going to happen. 
So it's, it's, it's getting the balance right, and probably no one wants to hear this. I usually work about 80% right, and if we do that, it's pretty bloody good. Um, that will work. You will always lose some, but the more you can have that Clover Lay working hard for you, and I think Ed mentioned it earlier, that don't stick the grass in the ground or the Clover Lay in the ground and walk away. If you drill it and then you get a, bel a belt of rain on it and it gets compacted, go and aerate it. Help it. Do a bit of steel to it to allow it to really flourish, and that could add 50% more production to you in two years, so that when you lose 20% of it, it's, it's, it's still a little... You're only at 85 now, rather than 80. So I'd simply chop it as soon as I can, or sit right as close to cultivation as possible, and then drill as close to it again as possible. I think by... In your case, by cultivating the clover in, you're probably seeing the nitrogen benefit quicker than s somebody who would, who would direct drill it because you're, you're physically destroying that, that plant, breaking it up. It's going to release its nitrogen probably a lot quicker than if you just sprayed it off or grazed it off, direct drilled a crop into it. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's perks to that as well. I think this gentleman in the front had a question. Have you found the like the deeper rooting multi species layers are pulling up better nutrients, are pulling them up from deeper down rather than your rye grasses, which are shallow rooting? I think we've seen in, in livestock health, looking at cattle, mainly more so than sheep for the further down the line with cattle potentially, that yeah, you're seeing a you're seeing a healthy animal and on calving on sorry, on cows getting back in calf again. We've gone from probably having 15% empty three years ago to this last year we had 4% uh, empty. So uh, on that basis alone, I'd say we've seen uh, improvements in cattle health, certainly. Yeah, we, we see when we've analysed grass or the like herbal lays and you look at the mineral profile, we've seen distinct different mineral profiles with different, different species. The other thing we've also seen against uh, straight ryegrass, for argument's sake, and then a herbal lay, when you look at a PLFA or fossilic, uh, a microbial test, the, the diversity under those herbal lays is distinctly different or Im improved compared to a monoculture of a, of a ryegrass. And that, again, is, is all about <coughs> building blocks for, the, for your rotation because the more diverse we've got in that root zone, the better the nutrient cycling will be. Yeah, all, all, these, all the different species will have different rooting depths, different root growth profiles, different nutritional uptake. So by having all that diversity in there... You, you know the theory makes sense you will have a sward that's full of more and more diverse nutrients um i haven't probably done as much measurement of of these multi-species forage lasers i should have done but andrew reese who was runner up to soil farm of the year competition last night he has done quite quite a lot of measurement of that and has, has definitely seen an increase in in uh nutrients being taken up by those multi-species lays so yeah, the, I, th I think the theory makes sense and the, and the data is there. Um, and guys have done it to, to analyse it. And I think, you know, Dan can probably touch on this as well, but Andrew shared his experiences last night of his, his cows now desperately want to graze those lays over, over and above the, the, um, the ryegrass lays to the point where I think he turned some cattle out in a, in a ryegrass lay having come from a herbal lay and they went and ate the hedge. Um, so, you, you know, your stock will tell you from, to that degree. And I think you've seen, seen the same, haven't you? Yeah, I think certainly if you're on daily moves like we are, your cows will be more content coming out of that paddock than a paddock of old permanent pasture, or like I say, a, a, a short-term ryegrass. What else have your cattle told you, or your, your livestock told you? You, know, you touched there about um, um, less empty cows. Um, what other Have you found any other benefits in the stock? Um, we... We had a, a, a rented farm probably 10 years ago now, and they before herbal lays were really a thing, and uh, it was a 17 species lay at the time, and we found that um, we had a group of, it would have been 50 or 60 ewes with lambs on there, and we were saw that the growth rates in the lambs, we didn't measure it, but it was quite obvious to the eye that you were pulling lambs off there at weaning that you could have almost killed, whereas you'd have lambs that were on the permanent pasture in the field next door that would still want, well, you wouldn't see them out till October, November in the year, so I think on that basis nothing technical but you can see that there's certainly a benefit to, to growth rates any other questions yep gentleman in the middle again hello oh um are you better to to top in your experience or to graze 
we've always grazed. Them. Yeah, we've always grazed them. We, we are mowing some for silage now, as of this year, um, just to try and see if we can get a comparison on inputs. And I mean, you look at the seed price of the herbal lane, you sort of step back, but then if you've not got to put any fertiliser on it for two cuts, then it pays for itself hands down, doesn't it, in the first in the first six months. So yeah, we're not we're not topping anything. It's all either grazed or, or clamped silage. We 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 struggle to outwinter where we are. We well, we're looking to try and extend the winter. We're not we're not there yet. We've got work to do, sort of thing. It's um, we hope to at some point be able to probably house cattle for three months rather than nearer the six we're doing. But we've got other things we need to get working first before we can do that. Um, well, we've done a obviously we've done the gold standard soil sample of, of Ian's, and then we'll we'll come back and do another test next year. Would it be? And and that'll be we won't know until we've done that actually what's going on. But I mean, you can see we we dug a soil pit last week, and you could see we put a so last year we did a lot of um, low disturbance flat lifting, and we were putting liquid gypsum, molasses, and uh, humic acid down behind the leg, and you can see in that top sort of two to three inches that the soil profile is already changing. There's a you can see a, di a slightly different colour in it, and you can you can see that there's more air pores going down into the soil. So it's it's all encouraging, but like I say, it's just very very early days at the moment. Yeah, and if you, I mean, Jill uh, Clapton was talking earlier on today. I don't listen to him about how when a cow grazes, the saliva and the chemical, the the notes going down the roots is having a different effect on microbial activity compared to cutting. I'm just plagiarising what she said. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it would kind of make sense again because the grass is meant to be grazed, ultimately. So there will uh, be probably an effect. Another speaker did say that as well. So Greg Judy said that earlier on. Uh, we talked a bit about um, soil testing as well and obviously you know, moving on from basic sampling. Um, some of these more complex um, assessments that we are doing, Ian, how often should we be looking at them to see you know, the improvements we've made? Uh, obviously, it's one size will not fit all, but what would be your sort of general recommendation? And normally, if you're doing a, a, one of these big detailed soil tests, we call it like a, a strategic soil test, you do that one every 10 years. Because it's brilliant. I mean, I'll, I'll come and test your field every year to show you're getting an improvement, but you'll see it in the grass. You don't need me to do that. <laughs> There's no point spending money on something. Excuse me, that you don't that, that you're seeing already. Yeah. So we, we would do a a, 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 long, a detailed soil test, make changes. We like to talk about gypsum, different cultivation depths, etc. See the results and not worry about it. But what, why am I going to spend money telling you what you know already? You might want to go back in say ten years' time and retest and say, well, blimey, what we've done is really good. We all meet up in the pub and buy a pint. Well done us. It, it, that that's all you do. So. Sometimes I think we're, we're guilty of collecting too much data. You know, it, stop. The big thing is doing something with the data. I've been on plenty of farms where they've, have you done a soil sample? Yes. Have you done anything about it? Well. Yeah, that, that's, that's one of the, probably our biggest bugbear. We go on farm, do you soil test? Yes. Well, where is it? And this file comes out covered in dust. And you like brush it off and look at it. Go, when did you last look at this? Oh, the, when the guy brought it back to me. Oh, brilliant. And then you open up, there's so much good data in there, but no one's taken any action on it. And sometimes there's a lot of, certainly in Ireland at the moment, there's a lot of free soil tests done. So if you get a free soil test done, no one ever takes any action on it at all. And I kind of go, why did you do it? And the first, well, it was free. All right, well done. So I don't care what test you do, but if you do anything, if you measure anything, whether it's measuring the, the amount of biomass you're going, act on it. Don't just collect data for data's sake. It's ludicrous. Measure it take action and that's kind of what Ed and I spend a lot of our time on it, it, it it's all about looking at data and advising on the back of that data to change and if we don't if you don't you don't necessarily need to change but probably if you're reading the numbers right there's things you could improve on go back to the deep freeze you know, it's one of the things we found with Dan he's got the biggest deep freeze ever he just wasn't using it or he's forgotten about it. not Dan but the farm had forgotten it it was there our skill is now with things in the rotation different uh, chemical inputs physical inputs is get the food out of the deep freeze. Take action, whatever you do. Have we got any more questions from the audience? No? Okay. 
Um, well, that's been really, really interesting. Um, I certainly, th um, I love your analogy of the freezer. Um, uh, someone who's food orientated, that's one that's going to stick with me. But um, I'm going to ask you all uh, what, uh, you know, just what, I, I always love somebody to come to a meeting or come to an event and they've got something they can take away and think about, think about adapting either, you know, maybe not necessarily exactly what you've said, but how can they implement that on their farm? So, Roger, what would be your um, one takeaway message? Um, pay attention to detail. So, um your soil tests, your um, your seed beds as well, and choosing the right fields and the right species for your farm. Ian, uh, take a soil test. <laughs> take 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 a soil test and and do something with the information. Do, do something with it, but also calm down. Just relax a bit more. People are scurrying around everywhere, desperately trying to do this, do that. It's like why? Just chill out a bit. Look at what you're trying to do and figure out what will be the bigger effect on it. We don't have to be busy all the time. Dan? I think both what you two have just said. Firstly, Roger, with the species, it's quite evident from these herbal lays we put in that clover and plantain both thrive in what we've got, but a lot of the other stuff you see very little of it sort of thing is there, but I don't know if it's providing a lot. And then also with Ian, probably I'm not the best for being particularly patient or wanting to take my time doing something and should probably actually try a few things in a small scale and find out what works because we have certainly... We've costed ourselves at times where we've gone in whole hog and done a whole block of ground and something's not quite paid off. So, yeah, I'll just go with both of them. <laughs> and Ed? Uh, I thought I'd, put, I'd probably steal Nike's quote and say, just do it, in terms of if you're thinking about trying things, doing different things, just do it. Because there's, there's a lot of good principles to follow about giving yourself the best chance of getting things right, but you'll always learn the best from doing it on your own farm. Um, and as much as we've been able to put ourselves in a good position to things work, the, the, the way it's happened is down just trying stuff, you know, so let's see what happens if we do that. And it doesn't have to be the whole farm in the first year. Just, just take one thing, try it, and then learn from it. Um, and you've certainly done that in terms of introducing, you know, block grazing, adaptive management grazing, uh, introducing herbal lays. It's not been the whole farm in the first year. We've 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 integrated it slowly and we've learned as we've gone along. But don't don't sit there thinking, oh, I'll try that one day. Just get on and do it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that action is key. But um, as Roger said earlier on, keep it simple. It doesn't. We are guilty of overcomplicating things. So, thank you very much to all the panelists here. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for coming to see us instead of George. Uh, we hope you found it useful, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.